start reflecting on yesterday's uh, material and to hopefully get a quick transition to the really exciting material that's coming for today. So <clears throat> yesterday we um, uh, talked further about the um, uh, central importance of the technique of particle filtering within this work. Um, uh, particle filtering, uh, as you are aware, uh, offers an incredible uh, potential for insight when making sense of uh, time series data from the world um, and relating it to a mechanistic model or system science model, <coughs> a model that aspires to capture a set of generative pathways, causal pathways underlying the um, uh, the, the system. I'm speaking here about the application of uh, particle filtering to health system science models, but uh, in general it is a technique that does require a state-space model, a, a model of, uh, uh, of the underlying um, of, of a system evolving over time. And um, in so doing, it provides this way of taking data from the world oh, that's, that's uh, characterized the dynamics in the world and asking what does it tell us about the underlying state of the process that's giving rise to that data. We pursue particle filtering by taking a state space model, system dynamics model, it could be an aggregate, an agent based model, it could be a discrete event model. Taking data from the world, it's data over time and relating the two, characterizing where within the state space model is come the analog of the, of the data from the world, and identifying specifically uh, likelihood functions that ask, given a certain state of the state space model, so the simulation model here, what would be the likelihood of observing a given datum, a given observation from the world. And in general, that observation consists of more than one particular piece of empirical data. Um, it may involve data of very different sorts, but data that ultimately relates to this underlying state space model. And within our particle filtering, by relating that connection, by starting with some prior distribution over the uh, states of the state space model, we characterize at any one time the joint distribution associated with the states of that model. So for our models, for example, if we take uh, SEIR models uh, related to to uh, Sal Yen's work, for example, um, we would have a distribution over that is a multivariate distribution over the number of people in it. So they, the S stock, the E stock, the I stock, and the R stock. Um, so, uh, so that distribution might, for example, tell us that um, uh, there is uh, uh, a high probability of a large number of of S, um, people in the S stock, um, but uh, the more we assume it's high in S, the fewer we assume uh, that we need to assume that, uh, uh, that there are people in R. And we might impose a prior distribution over this. And as data comes in from the world, we will shape our understanding of what's going on in two ways. Number one, the data will clue us into the underlying state. Number two, the state of the system will be evolving, the underlying system. And we're always relating what's the current state of the system to what the data from the current time tells us. And that shapes our understanding for future time points, reflective of the fact that particle filtering is a recursive algorithm what we understand is applying now in terms of the state of, mo of the model is influenced by the latest data point and the dynamics of the underlying state space model. 
the underlying dynamic simulation model, but it's also influenced by the data that we have observed from the past. The data that we've seen previously in as much as it shaped our understanding, the model's understanding of what was previously going on. And so within a particle filtering context, we're characterizing this distribution over the, the state of the system, including many aspects of latent state that we don't observe directly, but which are collectively implied. Knowledge about them can be, can be induced by putting together, on the one hand, the evidence we do have, from certain areas of the system, and secondly, the logic of the system. For example, if we consistently saw very few people ex emerging from the exposed state to the infectious state, uh, it would tell us something different about the likely number of people in the S state, the susceptible state, than if we saw tremendous numbers of people coming from E to I. It's not just that it tells us there's a different number of people in S. It may tell us, for example, if we're seeing lots and lots of people getting infected uh, from e, from it, it emerging from the latent E state to the uh, infective a, uh, I state, it also tells us that S, whatever it is, it's going down quickly <laughs> because it's, it's being drained by this outflow, right? And commensurately or correspondingly, um, conversely, if we have an inflow into the S state associated with births and we see very few people getting infected, it's telling us that almost certainly there's lots of people backing up in this S state. And lots of people, the population in the S state is rising, even though we don't see it directly. It, it's in the nature of the system that if you see very few infections here, and if you know something about the E state, that it's of limited duration, and often quite short duration, a couple of days, it tells you that there's got to be a large number of people backing up an S if you have a significant birth rate. And the particle filtering models that Xiao Yan showed, um, that she applied uh, yesterday and the day before, really captured this logic. And, and there's a certain intelligence, um, you could call it a form of artificial intelligence that puts those pieces together and, and uh, realizes that, okay, it, it must be that if you're seeing certain dynamics at this part of the system, let's say people emerging from latency, uh, it must be the case that you're seeing something else in other areas of the system. It fits those pieces together of the model logic and what we observe through the data. And that's very powerful. And we saw that yesterday um, brought to a further level of virtuosity and, and insight in the form of these models which incorporated multiple types of disease processes, um, multiple types of underlying processes largely operating independently, but sharing a common substructure or common, common drivers. So to, to oversimplify it, and maybe I'll, just to show you know, some measure of generality, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll add a couple differences between these, um, between these systems here. But if we had these sort of two systems which represent different, um, uh, different underlying progressions. Um, uh, in Cheyenne's case, one might have been uh, measles and another chickenpox, but um, Olivia is extending this to uh, uh, three conditions with influenza. Um, in other cases, we might have diabetes and heart disease or, or diabetes and hypertension. Um, or aspects of uh, smoking status and um, substance use or what have you. The point is we have these two different processes and then we have some common drivers for those processes. Um, in Cheyenne's case, these were, these were a mixing matrix where different people in the population were mixing. And that ended up driving you know, things going on in both of these processes, which are strictly downstream 
of that mixing process in her models. And particle filtering using data concerning these two processes, although these two processes were not biologically coupled um, in, a, in a pronounced way, doing particle filtering on process A and process B shed light on this common structure such that using only data, so if you use data about B, it tells you a lot about A and you can have the opportunity for the reverse as well. And, it, and using data from both can shed a special light you know, on this mixing matrix in ways that, that will enhance the other, the characterization of the estimation of the other process, the other underlying process. This is an extraordinarily powerful um, uh, application of particle filtering and one with a lot of generality. But like other applications of particle filtering, we were seeking to estimate the underlying state of the system that gives rise to the data we observe. This is the data generating process that we posit to be applying. And in light of this, we took data from the world and say, what does that data tell us about the underlying evolving state of this process? And we get a special clarity of common areas in this example for Xiao Yan that, are, that we can understand something about from both the disease, both the data for, say, measles and the data for chickenpox, both of those whisper to us about the contact matrix. And if we consider both together, we'll get a, a special clarity of resolution of that contact matrix. But we're still trying to estimate this underlying state of the system. So with particle filtering, or sequential Monte Carlo methods, as they're often termed, um, here we're, we're sampling from the latent state of the system, which we, we write traditionally as x of, as x, where it's subscripted by the time. And so x of 1 colon t means we're actually characterizing the state of the system over time. But it's not merely that. It's not merely we're, we're characterizing it over time. We are we are characterizing trajectories of the system over time. That's what that x of uh, 1 colon t is. And this is a very important point that I hope sank in yesterday, but, um, but I thought I'd, I'd offer a couple words on it again. Um, the observation here is that, that often we end up, um, uh, well, typically, most commonly in particle filtering, such as the case used from uh, Xiao Yan's examples, we were looking cross-sectionally at, um, uh, at the, uh, the state of the system at any uh, given one time. Okay? Um, and what this gave us was a picture at any one time of what we knew at that time based on all the data until that point. And at the cost of kind of um, shifting here between different, um, uh, different um, slide slideshows, maybe I'll just pull up a picture here so we can be a little bit more specific about it. It could be from Cheyenne's examples, but it could also be from this one, okay? Um, really any, any of the particle filtering examples you've seen have been, um, have shared this characteristic where, you know, if, if we show the data and we examine, for example, here, um, this posterior distribution at time 20, that, that's characterized by this kind of uh, green, green color. It's a 2D histogram and it shows in darker green where it's a high posterior density region and, and it's lighter color where it's, it's not as high, high probability um, a region. But if we consider this band of green for time 20 here, and um, what, is, what is that posterior taking to account? Here, 
And in all the examples that were shown to you, including by Stao Yen's eminent examples, what this band is saying is that given all the data prior to that point, this is the distribution implied of, in this case, the number of searches um, uh, for, for at that time. So the key point I'm trying to make is that that, that particular distribution we're, we're approximating here, we're showing, we're sampling from and displaying, that distribution is conditional on all the data observed till that point. Now so after that point, we're observing some additional data here. But we're not going back, and I think this is related to a question Simon asked, we're not going back in light of these later data points um, as we're approaching this sort of point where the current time is, we're not going back and re-examining what we believe was the case at time 20. We're just leaving that as it is and we're, we're simulating. And, and we're going to be going through jointly a particle filter model. It's anatomy. We're going to be dissecting it in the afternoon jointly. And we're going to be running it together, if you have any logic and going through its constituent pieces. And what you'll see is as you run that model, it will be displaying out the distributions here in ways that will be um, progressively showing if we, given all the data till now, what is implied here for the posterior distribution. But it's not going back and re-examining those in light of lighter, in light of lighter evidence. It's almost like we're only applying the forward algorithm for an HMM, taking into account past data and not future data. Now, all that's reasonable in the sense that, as Kierkegaard said, we, we, learn, we live forward but learn backwards. <laughs> and um, we're dealing with just evidence till this point and we're needing to understand the situation at this point in light of that limited evidence. We don't have the, the, the benefit of, of foresight and knowing what's gonna come after this. But if you want to understand what was probably the case at a certain time based on a future stance, a future vantage point, we need to go beyond this. And we need to engage in something that particle filtering readily supports, but was not shown in any one, any one of the slides, which was sampling from trajectories. And I kind of nodded to this and, and commented on it, but I want to emphasize the fact there's a profound difference, a marked difference between sampling cross-sectionally for understanding at a given time and sampling longitudinally these trajectories in light when you have lots of later evidence. So sampling cross-sectionally at a certain time, you know, um, here uh, chooses a, a particle at that time based on information observed up to that point. When we sample trajectories, if we have a lot of evidence later, the sampling that we do, we sample these trajectories, what those trajectories collectively suggest about what was going on at this time may be very different than when we considered only evidence to this current point. It may include consideration of evidence from later times that are quite conclusively show a, a much more particular situation was obtaining at this time, was occurring at this time, than we had first realized using only evidence to this, to this point. Case in point being, maybe we don't know how many people are susceptible to, um, you know, to uh, pertussis within the greater Saskatoon area, but if there were a big outbreak that occurred next week for pertussis, it would tell us something pretty significant about what had happened. We, we don't know that information now, and so if we were to create a posterior distribution based on what's been observed to this point, we might play down the number of susceptible people but that, that are susceptible at this time, you know, this uh, August 2nd. But if next week we see a big outbreak, 
that should lend understanding for how many people were susceptible as of August 2nd that's probably significantly larger because it's added new evidence to the table. Simon. Just so that I'm understanding it right. So yes. It points T minus one. Yes. So previous from some certain time point. Yeah. That's almost like the posterior distribution of the weights. And the and all the weights all, all the beliefs after are almost the prior prior distributions for upcoming future. That's correct. Right. That's correct. Right. So in if if you were to wade through those slides, um, uh, sorry, sorry, no, no reference to weight. Um, <laughs> if you were to, to slog through those slides, um, um, you would, uh, that I shared with you at the mathematical definition, you'll find that what's going on with particle filtering is precisely evasion characterization where you have, you have this constant, um, uh, alternation between priors, uh, observing evidence to make that the posterior at time t, um, and then, so you, so you have a prior at time t minus one generated by virtue of previous evidence till that point and, uh, you know, up to time t minus one, and then simulation unaided by observation from t minus one to t. And that gives you a prior for the distribution at time t minus one for the latent state of the system. I'm sorry, at, at, simulated for to time t, then gives you a prior for time t. Then you have an observation at time t of one or more particular observations, you know, a general vector of observations. That updates that from a prior to a posterior at that time. And having updated that to a posterior distribution, you're then set you know, after any, and so that's a weight update and any resampling and so on. It, it's still a valid from a, a, from even without the resampling, it's still a valid um, uh, distribution characterization using uh, principles of importance sampling. And then you're going to run forward to time t plus one and you'll then have a prior for time t plus one ready for updating to a posterior when you observe the data at time t plus one. And so you have this going back and forth between um, priors and posteriors, where the priors are actually generated by running the simulation unaided by evidence. Now what Dr. Liu was referring to is, and this is actually a very interesting ongoing dialogue between she and I, um, that in principle, there might be cases where you can um, more savvily anticipate, rather than just running the simulation model from time t minus one after that last observation to time t, unaided by, by any knowledge of observations, there may be ways you could shape that simulation so it's a less naive prior at time t, in which case you might be able to use fewer particles. Um, now, uh, it's, it's interesting because there's, in the, in the mathematical statistical literature that, that focuses on these areas, there's um, some conflicting sort of ideas about that, that it, I get the sense, and she's quite interested in that, I'm quite interested in whether we can improve on things, but at a practical level, characterizing the algorithms in models, it's actually extremely nice to just be able to run it forward. Where this typically will lead to less good results is uh, in certain cases where there's a real mismatch between um, uh, the time, how quickly the model becomes uncertain um, relative to the interspacing of the evidence. And if you have evidence which only arise very rarely and the model dynamics are very rapid, you know, the model may quickly get confused about what's going on without some more savvy understanding of, of the nature of recent data and so on. And there may be a way of arriving at a less naive prior, in short, in those cases. But for most of our cases, we haven't found that a, a, a practical problem in the health area for most cases. Um, uh, there, there are cases where, like with the um, Chin Yang's work, um, 
with mosquitoes, mosquito data, when we were only observing data weekly, you, you might not think, you think that mosquitoes, you know, their population doesn't change that quickly. It actually does change pretty quickly. And in the course of a week, midsummer in Saskatchewan, you know, in the midst of, of humid, sticky weather like we saw yesterday, thunderstorms that, that greeted us this morning, um, perhaps roused you from your slumber. Um, uh, th there's actually significant dynamics associated with the mosquito population. The course of the week can change the situation significantly. So if you don't have data on a daily basis there, you are, um, um, you're at risk of coming up with a prior distribution at week plus one, which is quite diffuse. And then you've got to collapse it down with the observed data. And it's not always, um, it, it doesn't always lead to really good, uh, to, to very effective prediction. But now that we have some daily data from the city, et cetera, lots of daily data, it's, it's less of a problem. So this issue of prior posterior updates, that is central to particle filtering. And the prior is largely dictated um, uh, between time t minus 1 and time t. A lot of the prior just comes from running the model naively without any shaping of it between time t minus 1 and time t. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Um, so here, though, we are, when we're talking about sampling trajectories, we're talking about sampling trajectories from a later point of hindsight. Like, maybe now we're at the end of the summer, and we want to know what the mosquito population was August 1st. Or maybe, you know, we are um, uh, at, a, uh, at a later time, uh, and we want to know what the latent TB population was at this earlier time. Um, and uh, we had some very interesting discussion on this yesterday and maybe the day before about the opportunities for learning from later data collection efforts that shed a lot of light using additional uh, quality of data, um, what's going on a year from now, two years from now, and then backcasting that to tell us what was going on earlier for explanatory purposes or to assess intervention to give better understanding of intervention gains. There's a lot of potential from that. And a key component here is sampling from trajectories. So sampling from trajectories is this key tool that allows us to infer what was going on in an earlier time on the basis of hindsight. And the fortunate picture here, which we'll take advantage of in spades and particle MCMC and later this morning, is that all we have to do is use the latest weights at the final time, the time that after we've considered the latest evidence available, sample from the particles there, and then trace their ancestry. So, so we sample from the particles at the final time according to their weight at that time, and then we just have to ask who is their mother, who is their grandmother, who is their great-grandmother, who is their great-great-great-grandmother. And we have to keep around, so we have to keep around that information, and we have to keep around information on um, what the state was of that great-grandmother or great-great-great-grandmother at that earlier time, so we know what that implies. And yesterday's, um, uh, yesterday's examples from Yen gave lots of great examples where, you know, early on, for example, in the first 50 time points, the simulation was kind of confused, it was kind of muddle-headed, <coughs> It was all blur about what the situation is, and then it became clearer over time. And so, by the, for some of the results, you know, it, it, it established a um, a much clearer picture down the road. And part of the observation here is if you sampled from the from the data later and backcasted to what was going on much earlier, you'd probably remove a lot of that confusion about what was going on in light of later evidence. And I would note, Lavi, for your purposes of geologic reconstruction, this is absolutely uh, you know, a, a central point because um, you can backcast to earlier times with much greater clarity 
in light of evidence from later eras. Um, in other words, to understand what was going on in the Silurian, you know, in terms of coastal deformation and subducted plates and so on, you don't need to just deal with data as it up to and including the Silurian, right? Um, uh, you, you can actually deal, you, you can actually get a lot of insight what was going on in the Silurian based on, on data observed later that would clue you into the paths of continents um, and of, of these uh, crustal elements um, that would shed light what was going on in the Silurian with much greater clarity. So um, sampling trajectories uh, is something that requires a bit of book, bookkeeping information. Um, uh, you have to keep track of an ancestry matrix, which is basically your genealogy, right? You have to, for every for every particle, you have to say who's its mommy, and who is its mommy, mommy's mommy, and you know, well, who is its mommy, and, and keep track of that for every observation point. And and where that changes, of course, is resampling, because of resampling, if if you have no resampling going on, if all you have is weight updates following observations, you don't particle I after the, the weight update is the same as particle I before, so it doesn't matter. It's really at resampling that, you know, some lineages die out, others multiply to multiple things. So you're going to find, potentially at the final time, a lot of people will have the same mommy. The previous, the previous you know, before the previous resample. And a lot of them will have the same grandma grandmother, right? And great-grandmother and great-great-grandmother. So um, you'll have a certain consensus often about what was going on earlier. Now, without a large enough number of particles, that will lead to a kind of group think about what was going on earlier because they're all descended from, you know, this primordial Eve or something like that. Um, that all of them trace their lineage back to Methuselah or something, you know. Um, they trace their lineage back to to um, to a, a particular ancestor, um, and therefore you get less variation back there. But you get the savviness that came from later observations. So you want a lot of particles. Yeah, Levy. Oh well, but isn't that what we want? Is that a group of particles mm -hmm. is surviving because That's of correct. the highway? Correct. So like, correct. I would just confuse. Like, what's the good balance between you know like? the amount of particles, yeah. and then how good it is. Because if we pick the one that's very good, so it's just carry the same good characteristic yeah. on the way down. Yeah. So obviously, in the end, you all trace back to the same good. Right, so right. Yeah, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket there. But um, it, you, you want to take into account that there may be there, there may be certain of the particles that, that have just a much more, um, much more effective, or much more competitive, or much more um, insightful view of the world, right? In terms, much more grounded view of the world in terms of what was going on. They were bang on. Um, I don't have a good answer for you about what the right number of particles was, and there was a bit of a you know discussion about this with Dr. Liu. Um, I'm still learning. What I what I would say is. I never trust a particle filter for production used with fewer than a thousand particles. Um, I, uh, I, I will run like Shayan. I will run for short periods of time for exploratory purposes to, to iterate for learning. I'll try something out with a couple hundred particles, maybe. Occasionally, I've been known to you know try this with a hundred particles to just see what happens, make sure I haven't introduced bugs in the model, just try try a little thing up, make sure I'm, I haven't specified, you know, some parameter that makes it act wacko, obviously. But then, to get any degree of confidence about the results, I want to hike it up to like a thousand particles. And, and I like to run particle filters with larger number of particles, like in the many thousands. And I think I'm not alone in this uh, preference. Um, 
And it's not without reason. It's because we've sometimes been jilted. Um, you know, if you have a, a, few, a few enough, you start to see a ragged character to the results. Like you start to see it fraying. And you saw this a little bit in some of Shai Yun's diagrams where you saw like almost individual trajectories. Or there were cases where it was so broad in its understanding, like, like this case with um, um, when, when it was trying to understand chickenpox pictures and at a broad distribution. If you have too few particles, it starts to look kind of ragged in there. It's not well approximated as a nice distribution. And, um, you know, so we go between kind of nimble exploration with few particles to, to get some insights to double check our changes. And then we do sort of um, semi testing runs, which have thousands of particles. And then we'll do like production runs, which might have 10,000 or more particles. I don't do those infrequently. I like to, I like to take advantage of the fact that computers can work while I sleep. Um, um, and, um, and, and so I like to run it overnight and, just, and I see, you know, my, it's like Christmas morning the next day. It's like, oh, great, you know, I get to see the picture. Where this will come in really important, really important, is in PMCMC in a few minutes. And then we'll be, we'll be talking about this in, in greater, uh, greater um, with greater emphasis because it's so important for PMC results, PMC, PMC, PMCMC results to be reliable. Yeah? I was just wondering whether this is because of the natures of the behavior of the problems that you were dealing with. Of the what? Of the problem or the, the model that you can yeah. see so you can yeah. tell like, okay, yeah. since there's so much dynamic in like the yeah. mental models already, therefore we need to explore all of these possibilities because it's just very complex. That's right, like very fast dynamics of certain sorts and you know, I think it reflects the evidence available, like the, the character of the evidence, how much it pins down the model. Um, the, Dr. Liu also mentioned some other characteristics, which I won't repeat, and, and others have as well. There's, there's a set of things that relate to this, and fortunately, one of the things I will tell you that I found is that when it comes to PMCMC, you have to be really sweating this. For particle filtering, I think we're doing okay. Like, like running it with 10,000 particle filters is not going to break the bank, you know, as far as performance, actually. Um, it's, it's pretty good. Like, like Sal Yan and myself, could, we can run it on our, on our computers, our laptops. Um, now, sometimes we'll run on another machine for convenience. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we'll let our, our computers, our personal computers sleep while while uh, we work, um, but but we'll run it off in some other bigger bigger computer that isn't you know slept and woken up in the course of our day or whatever. But like ten thousand particles with a with a reasonable model isn't isn't too bad to do. Um, but um, but when it comes to PMCMC, it's really quite sensitive to number of particles, and there and there it's really heavyweight, and we need to sweat. Uh, sweat uh, some considerations of performance. So we're still learning on this. Uh, I would say um, th there's part of the learning that comes from our experimentation and, and kind of seeing how it works in this case and that case, a little bit anecdotally and, and observing what seems to make a big difference. I will further tell you that Dr. Liu has an understanding at a theoretic level in computational statistics that is also extra depth and reference to a literature that that has done formal experiments. So I'd say the jury's still out on like what the full set of trade-offs are, but um, but you know big picture don't don't deal with a small like a couple hundred particles and think you're gonna always get reliable results because you're not. You should try you know in the thousands to get good results and it's it's typically not a problem, you know, performance level. Yeah. How long does it take? To, like, but, um, is it an R also, or is it any? We, we do it in any logic, okay. but you can do it in R. Um, and we have code actually to perform particle filtering in different, 
different systems. Any logic, for reasons you'll see this afternoon with this example model, it's kind of easy to describe in any logic. There's kind of a template which we have, which I've provided to you. And actually, I'll provide some additional notes on how you adapt it, where there's kind of like three or four classes of things. There's things that you know you just copy. Each time you do it, these are just like the standard stock components. You just reuse them. You don't have to change them at all. There's certain things which you have to change, where you have to kind of tweak it. There's certain things which have to have areas of it rewritten for a certain area in a kind of straightforward way. It's like it's fairly obvious how to update it for your model. And then there's some things that you got to write, like your likelihood function. You got to, you know, you, you need some logic for your likelihood that you specify, and it may be very different from what I'm using. And so, so there, you kind of do these things. You turn the crank, and you have a working particle filter model that has graphical output, et cetera. Um, and it's, it's quite nice. Um, uh, you, you get feedback while it's running that allows you to see is it, is it behaving reasonably. And that, that's really helpful because it allows you to go back and, and tune it if, if it's misbehaving. Um, um, we also do a lot, you'll see some comments on our particle, a particle MCMC platform which incorporates particle filtering and that. And that's like whip faster. It's like, I don't know, it's like 100 times faster or something like that. Um, but it doesn't have that interactive graphical output, so we can't really see how it's doing until it's done. And all of this is transient state because, you know, with people like Lugier um, on the beat, um, we're going to be able to have a much better infrastructure soon, I'm, I'm confident. But in terms of how long it takes, Cheyenne, do you want to comment on that? Uh, you run these things day in, day out. Yeah. So, so for the kind of the most uh, uh, simple model is for the aggregate SEIR model, there's only, I think, it's about six, seven states. Mm -hmm. If I run 5,000 particles, I think it's around one to three hours in any logic. That's for Java. I think that, that would be much longer than the C code. Yeah, C yeah. code. Yeah. <laughs> so C code will be like a couple seconds maybe, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So the longest uh, particle filtering I have read is for the potassium with 32 age groups. Yeah. So that will be 32, at least 32 times eight states. So Two for that, six. yeah. And uh, I have run 10,000 particles. It will be run for two to three days for the analogic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. So that's, that's painful. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. What, what kind of machine? What kind of machine configuration? Uh, the 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 memory is is sixteen gigabytes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for the ten, for the for that model, I mean the uh, thirty two age group analysis model with ten thousand particles. Uh, eight eight gigabyte memory is not enough. So okay. I need to yeah. Yeah, so it's dependent on RAM or CPU? RAM is, uh, so CPU, so, so, so this is really good. If you're interested in asking these questions, this is like our bread and butter. So just tell me if I'm going too deep, okay? Um, I'll try to keep my comments at a high level, but uh, we could go deeper if you wanted to do so. So um, RAM is going to be important because um, if you have a big model, you're going to need a copy of it for every um, for every particle, right? And, and there's a, a lot of numbers that each particle is going to have to trot around, right? And especially if you have something like an ancestry matrix where you've got to record, you know, for previous time steps what the state was and, and so on. It's um, you know it, it can add up memory-wise. Um, there's some additional things too with, I think, um, we're, we're doing this graphical display and there's data sets recording like the results over time to, to, to accumulate. And, and that adds up to gigabytes of, of memory when we're running it um, that, that are significant. Um, but Cheyenne, um, uh, are there key memory uh, consumption things that I haven't mentioned before I go into GP, to, uh, to talk about the processing side, the processor side? 
Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, are there anything you want to add about memory? Yeah, so, so what I will say is, my, my sense is that any logic is kind of, um, I could go on on this for a while, any logic is somewhat bloated, and it is somewhat, um, uh, it is somewhat um, slow, gratuitously. Um, and part of that has to do with a nice graphical interface that it lets you see what's going on. And that's important for learning, but it's, um, it chews up memory and it chews up um, you know, processing time a little bit. In Java, it's, it's, it's just not as, as fast as it could be. There's no question. Um, so yeah, like the C code um, in, in Particle MCMC is, is, I don't know, 50 times faster or something like that. So it's just, you know, just whip, whip fast compared to it. And, and it needs to be. That's why I wrote it in C, because, because it needs to do this every MCMC iteration. So, you know, each MCMC iteration might take one second, and it's got to be simulating, you know, 800 particles, uh, each simulating across the entire simulation model or something like that. Um, now, any logic is not very good at taking advantage of multi-core parallelism when you are executing the particle filter, okay? So it's just not, and this is the nature, I can tell you as a computer scientist, it's the nature of modern programming languages and uh, environments that, that unless you craft it to be parallel at the level of different particles, it's not going to realize the opportunity to simulate this particle separately from that one as you're, as you're running them forward. It's just gonna do them sequentially. So you're gonna have one process that says, I'm gonna work on particle one now, and it simulates it forward from time t to time t plus one. Now it's time for particle two, and it simulates it forward from time t, plus t to t plus one. And it'll do this sequentially for each particle, which is brutal. Um, and so Lugia is working right now on, um, on GP. I'm, I'm using these types of um, sophisticated graphics hardware that come with a lot of machines now um, to run this all in parallel. And so commonly a machine like this, or like many of those in the room, um, they have these graphics cards that are optimized to do things in parallel. And along with that is the ability for some of them to do, well, it varies between hundreds of things in parallel to thousands of things in parallel. The, the, the research forms of these, which are more expensive, allow you to do like 8,000 computations in parallel. And those are really well suited to particles because they can be used to sort of simulate forward thousands of particles at the same time. And so there, you know, we can use parallelism. But by and large, like any logic that's not smart enough to do it, R tends to be quite poor at taking advantage of that too. Um, these packages are just not set up to realize the opportunities for, for larger scale parallelization. Now what, what tools like that can do is when it comes to PMCMC, they can, as we say, run multiple walkers on different cores and, or different machines. The fact is our group does a lot of exploitation of parallelism in a way that would be accessible to anyone in this room, I'm pleased to say, which is you have, a, you have a set of machines maybe associated with your lab. Maybe they're just the machines in front of each student, but not all of them are in intensive use all the time. And if you have a particle filter, you, you might run it with different parameter assumptions on a couple machines simultaneously. And that allows you to sort of see how those experiments are playing out in parallel. And you can do something that would take, you know, a week in, overnight, right? Because you can, you can run it in parallel. And we do a tremendous amount of that. We have additional ways with any logic for, for doing that in an especially nice way. We would sort of send it over to different machines and it runs headless, um, which means there's no like, the, it doesn't need to be running with a monitor and stuff like that. It'll be, it'll be running, <laughs> I think while we're here, Shin Yang is running on a whole bunch of different machines. 
occasionally while someone else is talking, I send her a note on Hangouts and I say like, what are the objective functions? And, and she reports back. But she runs it on all these different machines. And the truth is people here, if you want to do that, we can show you how to do it. But taking advantage of different machines for parallelism is a good thing. Because memory, because memory, right? If you run on multiple cores of the same machine, you need a bunch of RAM. You need a bunch of memory. And we have that, but people who come to our boot camps generally don't have access to you know, big iron machines with 256 gigabytes of RAM. Um, make friends with computer scientists. Um, but the truth is that we only have a few machines like that. We have like, we have Scorpio and, and a few others. The truth is, if you run it, if you have a bunch of machines, commodity machines, like laptops that you buy, and, and you know, um, I bought my last laptop, not this one, the one before it in London Drug, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's just, you know, it had, a, it had 32 gigs of memory, I think I stuck it, I bought it for that reason, but otherwise it was a commodity laptop. And there, with most laptops, I can, you can run an any logic. Uh, particle filter on it and just have it running parallel with another one and then you just harvest them and you watch how they're doing and, and you can do things a lot faster by being judicious about how you run them. And sometimes we run them in staggered ways, some we run for, this is more a PMCMC thing, but um, uh, or if you're doing calibration or optimization, you're adjusting parameters for the particle filtering that you don't know, because remember, particle filtering is not to estimate static parameters. That's the province of MCMC, PMCMC. And that's what we're getting to. But if you need to optimize parameters with a particle filter model, you do standard calibration and minimize the discrepancy from the particle filter. And, and there's you can run it for different lengths of optimization in parallel. So that's what Chen Yang is doing over there in the Fedora. Um, um, she, she puts her optimization hat on and she'll run you know, some long optimizations, some shorter optimizations to learn quickly um, to get results soon. And, and she, she, we just have like, I feel it's a wasted time if we don't have, a, you know, wasted opportunity if we don't have a bunch of things running at a time. Um, so I'm hoping some of my students are running MCMC or PMCMC chains while we're while I'm talking here. Um, but we keep things going on different machines, and that means each machine typically has enough memory to support at least one particle filter. For the big iron machines like Scorpio, she can run how many how many things can you run at a time on Scorpio? Uh, we do need how many? How many how many like any logic uh, particle filter? Uh, uh, say same time. Yeah. Uh, the simulation. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh fifty. Fifty. Okay. Yeah. Right. The run. If, yeah. Well, I think it has forty cores. Yeah. Forty cores. Forty cores. Forty cores. Yeah. 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 And so it's in the code is in any logic to parallelize. Uh no. What we do is she she sort of fires them up manually. I think. Uh, yes, this is compiled uh, yeah. to Java code. Yeah. So, so well, you export basically. It's you export from any logic, and that exports com compiled code. Yes. Which you then just stick on the machine and say run, basically. Yes. And we can share with you any, anything you want yeah, for this a, infrastructure. It's a fast, a script yeah. that you can now, any logic also has some sort of cloud computing. I shouldn't say some sort of. They have a fairly articulated cloud computing. Facility set up so you can, with any logic, if you're willing to pay for it, you can say, "Hey, go compute these in the cloud," and it will just do it for you. But I don't like paying through the nose, so so I refuse to do that. And and we can do it, and we're glad to share the scripts with you. It's actually very boilerplate stuff. You just sort of, you know, take this, export your model from any logic, take this, put it on the machine, run it, boom. And, and then it will run, and 12 hours later, you get you know tons of particle results or something like that. She can show you how to do it. She has many tricks uh, up her sleeve and uh, uh, sophisticated, uh, uh, sophisticated understanding.
Um, she can pull rabbits out of that hat. Um, okay, so those are some comments on parallelism um, and uh, sampling trajectories. We need enough to sort of roll back the stack. We need enough particles to sample from trajectories so they're reasonably diverse. And so we like to run it with 10,000 you know, particles often, right? And, and, and that can allow us to sample historically in ways that are insightful. Um, yes, the so last thing. That's what I was saying. So I didn't know that you just said is that the reason why PMC MC is do so much better work for like particles, I'm not particles, parameters to you. Because part, particle filtering you were saying on the comments earlier, as far as I understand, is it's not used for tuning the parameters. Param particle filtering by itself. Yeah, yeah. Particle filtering does not estimate parameter values for static parameters. Mm -hmm. Its job in life for particle filtering, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to drive this point home, um, home here, is um, the job in life for, so each of these techniques has a certain job that it, it, it accomplishes. And I've given you some slides which help you judge which technique to use for which task. Particle filtering's job in life is to take as a given the parameters, theta. And it, by the way, all of these techniques, as I am showing them here, take as a given a model. The truth is PMCMC and MCMC can do model selection as well. But that lies outside the scope of what I can cover this course. For that, um, it, it gets much more sophisticated, and we need Dr. Liu um, you know, to, 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 to do a lot of consultation further there. It gets, it's more sophisticated with reversible jump, particularly when you have totally different parameter spaces for different models, okay? Um, but for, for, for particle filtering, its job in life is to take as a given parameters and model. And for those parameters and model, you know, estimate, sample from trajectories from time one to time t given the data that's observed from time one to time t, okay? And t, of course, can be advancing over time. And so you, you know, only consider the first data point, you're sampling for that, and then the second one comes along and gets sampled. But, in the, but you could go in hindsight and sample back, right, what was going on earlier. Okay, so that's particle filter. It takes as a given this theta. Chen Yang there? And, and uh, I think Olivia has done it, Zaru has done it. The, um, they will do a lot of these in the context of calib in the context of optimization. They will op find parameter values, theta, through running the model again and again with different thetas in an optimization algorithm. Ours uses OptQuest, which is built into any logic. It adjusts the, the parameter values to find the parameter assumptions that allow the particle filter discrepancy, the discrepancy between the observed data and what the particle filtered model expects in terms of the posterior. It tries to minimize that discrepancy. Or you can use the prior um, if, if you want to. But but the point is, it tries to find parameters that allow the particle filtering to perform best in terms of matching that data. That is not per se particle filtering algorithm. That is using the particle filtering algorithm as a module, you know, as a, as a way of, of estimating the latent state um, of the system and estimating as part of this, the discrepancy of what the model expects compared to what the data expect while, while savvily updating that model state, right? So in other words, particle filtering is robust in the sense that if there's stochastics which occur, it 
changes its understanding of the underlying state of the system to accommodate those observations from the world. It, it takes information from the world in the form of observations, and it uses it to shape its understanding of the latent state of the system that it simulates. And, and so what you get out from a particle filter model is a model that can much better account for the data um, given a set of parameters than that model would un unassisted by particle filtering, right? It can, a particle filtered model, we, we, we've seen this in, in different examples. If you particle filter your model compared to the not particle filtered version of the model, it's like night and day. You can much better account for the vagaries of the data. You remember those slides from Xiaoyan where she showed uh, an unassisted model, right, versus an assisted model. It's, I have other slides of it uh, here, but it's like the difference between this and something like, like this, right? Um, we can much better match what's going on with a particle filter version of a model compared to an unassisted version of the model. And because we can accommodate the vagaries of stochastics and correcting model misunderstandings, when we optimize theta for in term where our criteria for optimization, our objective function is the discrepancy between the particle filtered model's expectations, say for its posterior, and the observed data, we actually can get a much better accurate reading on what theta is that will give us a model which when particle filtered will be very, very good in terms of accuracy. That's what that MIT thesis I referred to before said. It's essentially you can arrive at a much better estimate for theta if you are correcting for model, you know, inability to anticipate stochastics and, and omissions. You can arrive at thetas that really are, are good quality estimates of theta that when used together with the particle filter model give you very good performance. So we do a lot of this. This is Chen Yang's like um, uh, bread and butter right now. Um, um, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't call it bread and butter. Um, uh, so <laughs> so um, this is, this is uh, this is, you know, a really good way to arrive at parameter estimates for a particle filter model, but it's not using particle filter to estimate those parameters. It's using an optimization process around particle filter. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and that's why it's Chin Yang Shi Fat. Um, uh, so uh, here, um, particle MCMC will be used. Well, we saw MCMC yesterday. That's used, given that same model, it's, it's a way of allowing you to estimate the, the distributions, a sample from the distributions associated with the, with the parameter values. That's what this theta is, right? That's the theta. Here, we took a particle filter, it took theta as a given. It took the parameter assumptions for the fixed parameters as a given. And we have to wrap to an optimization around this to estimate those thetas. MCMC, its job in life is to estimate the thetas given, given the observed data. But it doesn't sample from the latent state. It doesn't in, in any way try to sort of correct model expectations of latent state. Particle filtering does. It's adjusting these weights, and that's shifting the distribution of the underlying, understanding the underlying situation. MCMC does not. It just samples from, from, uh, from possible parameter values in light of this, the, for the model in light of this data. Particle MCMC, which we'll be getting to before we go to lunch here, that samples from both theta and the latent state given these observations. So this does the joint job of sampling from both. Now that's different than optimizing. Chen Yang there is optimizing the values of theta. She's finding the best estimates for how mosquito 
detection probability is affected by weather from this data and this model, right? Reflecting the fact that some of the variations we see over time in mosquito counts are reflective of mosquito dynamics as driven by weather, et cetera. It's the underlying population of mosquitoes, but others of those fluctuations are driven by detection probability, which is also affected in a big way by weather. And Chen Yang, in her inimitable way, is teasing out those differences and is using optimization of theta to, to, to arrive at that, where she's optimizing this over particle filters that in a way that minimizes the discrepancy between particle filter expectations and, and uh, real world data. But that arrives at a single privileged point estimate for theta. It's, it's arriving at like one estimate to rule them all for theta. It's like, I'm gonna put my eggs in, my mosquito eggs in this basket. Okay, this value of theta. Theta is a vector of parameters. It's the assumptions about the fixed parameters of the system. Particle, at Particle MCMC, we are going to sample from theta and x. So we're not putting all our eggs in one basket, mosquito or otherwise. Um, we are sampling different possible values of theta, reflecting the fact that the evidence may suggest some ambiguity about what theta is, and we want policies that are robust and expectations for trade-off between interventions or between projections or understanding the situation that reflects there's some considerable uncertainty often about theta, about the parameter values. And this allows us to sample from them. This is our rogues gallery of different, different methods, ladies and gentlemen. These are the different methods we can apply. Particle filtering, is, it's not accurate to say Particle filtering, you can't do anything about parameter assumptions, you're only sampling for latent state, and there's, you know, you, you, you're hopeless, you could just have to live with the assumptions about parameters you have in the house. No, far from it, you just optimize them. You just optimize them separately, just like we do with calibration for a model. Um, but it's a more savvy calibration than calibration is in a naive way, because it corrects for the latent state of the system. So you get much better quality thetas out um, to, to anticipate model evolution, because you are recognizing which of these, um, which of these uh, sort of fluctuations, um, you're, you're, you're in the midst of, of simulating this, you're able to capture many of these fluctuations in terms of your understanding of latent state, and you can tune you can tune a model that, when particle filter gives really great results, um, because it has theta, particular values of theta that are chosen. But particle MCMC takes that to another level by allowing you to sample from tr from whole distributions, joint distribution over theta and over the latent state. Okay, is that helpful, Alevi? Okay. Um, so those were some comments um, about um, sampling from trajectories. Uh, we got into some issues with uh, performance there, which are going to be highly appropriate for PMCMC. Um, what I will say is this. Um, I, I will further remark, and this is related to a discussion I had yesterday with Simon. Um, I'm very interested. So I showed you yesterday, for purposes of exposition, what I showed you yesterday was a particular simplistic way of performing MCMC. Markov chain Monte Carlo methods um, actually support a whole family of different methods. Okay? I showed you one approach yesterday that could be put into a slide. And it was a particularly simple approach. It's a particularly general approach. And it, um, it's widely, widely supported. But this notion of Markov chain Monte Carlo is much more general than the random walk Metropolis Hastings approach I showed yesterday to sample from theta. And a wide family of algorithms here can also be used for particle MCMC. So it's worth knowing there's many algorithms here. And some of them, turn out to be quite a bit more efficient than the one I showed you. 
Um, and putting aside parallelization and GPUs using graphical processing units and multiple machines, there's probably a lot we're going to gain in future years within my group and elsewhere by using more sophisticated MCMC algorithms. Some of you may be wondering why MCMC? Okay, I, sh I should explain this. So there's two parts of this. This is Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And there's explanations for both these things. And I actually have a slide that I showed yesterday um, in the slides that I've shared. I've been sharing slides on the drive on a very regular basis for each day of this boot camp. And I'd suggest that you take a look at them if you are interested in diving, uh, diving into any of these. But we had a, okay, so why, why aren't I finding it uh, trivially here? Um, here we go, uh, MCMC and uh, Mumble, okay. Um, so, come on, okay, why are you being truculent? Oh man, oh Windows. Not <laughs> responding. This is why I run Linux. This is all within Linux, okay. Okay, finally it sorts by, by date, okay. Um, I have to tell you, I love Linux, but I have had a devil of a time transitioning from Linux when it comes to my presentations. Because the Linux open office presentation, like it's, it's analog to PowerPoint, is pathetic. And Google Slides is just not yet convenient and good enough for me. So I've been stuck in Windows for PowerPoint. Um, and I know people say, my fellow, my fellow colleagues sneer at me for having a non-Mac, and they say, go get a Mac, but I'm not going to pay three times as much for the same. <laughs> Sorry, thanks. I, I'd rather spend it on my students. Um, OK, so um, MCMC, what I was saying is MCMC, that term has a particular, um, has a particular sort of connotation. And I, I um, want to unpack it a little bit. Firstly, the, the Markov chain refers to the fact, I need to distinguish this, because this was a point of a lot of confusion when I first engaged with this. I was looking for a Markov chain. I was looking for a sort of Markov model. I was saying, there's got to be a Markov model in here somewhere. Where does it represent this Markov model? You know, I was looking around, like, where are the nodes and these edges on this Markov model that it's manipulating? None of the discussions do I see a discussion of that. So I thought, like, what am I missing? It's bizarre. But it turns out that the Markov chain is implicit. And all that Markov chain here means in MCMC context here is that it's something quite prosaic. Okay, remember yesterday we talked about this? At a certain point, we're at a, we're at a certain point for the value of theta. We're at a certain place in terms of the value of theta. And in general, this is many dimensions, but I, I've shown it here in one dimension. So theta has, at any one time, we have a current theta. And then we try candidate thetas. And based on a simple rule, we either accept or reject those, and then that might become our current place, or we just repeat this, and we pick another one. Remember that from yesterday? This theta is our current point. We talk about that being our point in the Markov chain. Markov chain just refers to the fact that we have a certain location at any one time. Just as in a Markov chain, you might be at a certain node at any one time. And then you have a certain chance of transitioning to another point at a certain time. Just as in a Markov chain, you have a chance of transitioning from one node to the next. So in a Markov chain, if you were to be explicit about Markov chain, like in hidden Markov models, have, have these Markov chains, right? Um, at any one time, you have a certain place, just like in MCMC, at any one time, you have a certain place. Um, you have a probability of transitioning to another place, and the Markov chain is to another node. Here it's to another parameter value. And that occurs with a certain probability. Otherwise, you may stay in your current place, just like 
with some Markov chains or these self loops. Typically, there is a self loop where you just remain here for longer time. Um, there's discrete time for most Markov chains. That's most common. And uh, here we have discrete iterations. Um, I'm here for this iteration. The next iteration, I'll either stay here if I reject that candidate, or I'll go to to where that candidate takes me. Um, so people talk about this like it's a Markov chain. And in fact, the terminology here is when we say we're running MCMC, when we talk about running an MCMC, um, uh, uh, running the MCMC algorithm, uh, we'll often talk about running a chain. And I might run many chains at the same time. This is one way we could do it, maybe on different computers. And we're, we're working towards a much more sophisticated infrastructure for this that we want to open source and make available to any partners. So if anyone's interested in using these, these infrastructure we're building, it's part of my philosophy of sharing as much as possible. I'm glad to share things. And Lucia, what, you know, we're getting 50 times speed up for some of the algorithms we're running. And we're aiming for transformative speeding up of the learning process for many of our, of our tools. That's for CCM, also for MCMC with uh, tools like uh, GPUs and FPGAs eventually. But here, these Markov chains that we are talking about um, are, are, are conceptual chains. We actually don't represent them. We don't reify them in a picture of a chain. We don't have any algorithm that says node here and edges to other nodes. It's nothing like that. It's just conceptually there's a chain here. Conceptually, we have a chain. We have a certain point. We have a probabilistic transition to other points. Um, and those, those points are connected to each other with probabilistic transition probabilities. We have discrete time or discrete here iterations where we either stay in the same place or go elsewhere. So we talk about it as running a chain. And often, we'll run many chains at the same time. We also talk about running many walkers, which are kind of random walkers over the space. So, so this is the Markov chain part. What's the Monte Carlo? What gives with that? So MCMC was actually invented probably in Los Alamos as part of the atomic bomb project, curiously, because they had to do calculations. Um, it was not invented in Monte Carlo, the, the, the principality in, in the Mediterranean area. Um, but it refers to Monte Carlo because Monte Carlo as a nation is most famous for gambling. It's a big haven for casinos. And that's been the case for, dec for centuries, I think. And what this algorithm involves is a lot of rolling of dice, like those casinos. It involves a lot of rolling of dice. Do I transition or do I not? I, I am generating random numbers to determine, am I going to transition or am I going to stay in the same place? This uniform, a draw from uniform probability. So this whole process is tied in with random, it's a random algorithm that involves constantly generating new random numbers, rolling dice, just like Monte Carlo, they spin roulette wheels and they roll dice and probably you know, do other weird things um, that generate randomness. So, um, so what I'm trying to say here is this Markov chain Monte Carlo unpacks to something much more prosaic. It unpacks to, okay, you have a certain point, you transition probabilistically to other points um, over some sort of discrete steps, and uh, it involves a lot of randomness. Within that sphere, ladies and gentlemen, within that sphere, there's a lot of different algorithms. And it turns out that putting aside parallelization and you know, fast hardware and stuff, which are things that, you know, as a computer scientist, I like to be able to exploit. They're low-hanging fruit for us. We can go and, and get <coughs> brilliant folks like Lugiev to work on, you know, getting these things running screaming fast. There's actually much deeper ways in which you can speed up this process. I'm personally very interested in a theory called uh, perfect sampling, which basically means that you explore this space in a much more savvy way 
than you would with um, uh, with if you just um, if you just explore it uh, in a sort of random wandering way. In other words, um, if we just wander down here with this, oh, oh, oh mm, sorry. Um, so so why aren't I seeing that nice diagram again? Um, come on. Um, if you're just wandering around in this space like this, you know, according to random perturbations, you're going to be revisiting the same place many times. And I was talking with Simon, we've, Simon and, and ourselves, we've used this algorithm from Andrew Gelman, which is, is called uh, uh, STAN, um, which basically avoids revisiting um, in a sort of trivial way certain things, um, uh, certain certain parts, certain inefficiencies and in how it does U-turns in its exploration. Um, but the theory of perfect sampling takes it to another level yet in terms of efficiency of, of exploring the space. You may wonder why not explore it in a grid sort of way. It turns out it's very inefficient to explore it in a grid. Um, it can be shown that. But, um, uh, but there's ways to explore this much better than just wandering around and you know, coming back to the same place potentially and so on. There's much better ways we can do things. And in the fullness of time, uh, as generations of students come and go, we'll probably have students working to optimize our algorithms with dynamic models, these theory-based models, for both MCMC and critically for, for PMCMC to take advantage of these things. And that may add as much speed up as what we get from using GPUs or something like that. And further, further make this much more savvy so you don't have to wait overnight, you just have to wait two hours or something like that for your results with really big chains, with many, many MCMC iterations. Um, so, so we're right now kind of at an early place in these uh, explorations of using these techniques with models. It's very doable, it's practical, it's super insightful, and it's feasible. But probably in another five years, we'll be in a totally different world when it comes to performance trade-offs. And, um, and we'll be able to deliver insights much more quickly, reliably, and speed that learning up that I argued from this very podium was uh, so central to the enterprise of dynamic modeling. Okay. So those are some reflections on yesterday. Any questions that I can answer before we break? And before we dive into PMCMC, kind of dying to get into that. Yeah? No, no, no. I was just excited for PMCMC. Yeah, well, I, I, you're not alone. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, questions? OK, so why don't we take a 10 minute break? And I will fire up my slides here on PMCMC, and we will see how PMCMC takes particle filtering and MCMC and weaves them together. The good news here, ladies and gentlemen, is there's nothing, now that you've seen MCMC and particle filtering, and we've come to sort of struggle with an understanding of them, PMCMC while it's very sophisticated algorithm for the basic understanding that you'll need, it will fall out of what you have already just by putting the pieces together. Okay? So we'll, uh, we'll uh, start up in about 10 minutes. Thanks very much. Hi. Hi. I have a question. I didn't know if it would be applicable to everyone. Yeah, um, sure. So I think I uh -huh. understand the basics, but what um, mm -hmm. I'm struggling with is like, yeah. so I'm with Maria Mayorga and Julie Ivey okay. at NC State, yeah. Yeah. and we don't do a lot of dynamic models, I guess. Okay. Like, yeah. But you had mentioned diabetes and heart failure. Yes. So like I'm looking at diabetes, and uh, I'm trying okay. to figure out yeah. how to apply this okay. to that. And so specifically, like I'm, I'm trying to get there. I feel like I'm close, but like I'm yeah. trying to predict 
when yeah. patients have microvascular complications. Right. And it's asymptomatic, right? So it's this latent state, and then right. all of a sudden they have it. Right. But it's right. not like a dynamic model. Right. Okay. So I'm trying to <laughs> see it. Like, and I think that PMCMC might work for some of my other work with like parameter yeah. estimation, but. Um, 